Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Mr. Kansa Anakwa will defend his academic thesis entitled Considering the Native Land of Witnesses, Cultural Influences on Memory Reports. Mr. Anakwa, may I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis? Dear Prorector, dear members of the Corona, dear families and audience here and online. Thank you all for being here for my defense. Within the next 15 minutes, I will be presenting a summary of my PhD research titled, Considering the Native Land of Witnesses, Cultural Influences on Memory Reports. People across the world have been socialized into their respective cultural contexts. They have different customs, values, and norms, which shape their behavior and also guide their social interactions. In an era of increased migration and globalization, society has become increasingly multicultural, which means that there is an increasing chance for cross-cultural interactions. And in such interactions, individuals are likely to bring to the fore certain cultural norms. The increase in multicultural nature of society also means that legal and investigative professionals will then encounter witnesses from cultural backgrounds different from that of the legal professional. For example, within law enforcement contexts, police detectives are more likely or it is inevitable that they will obtain eyewitness accounts in cross-cultural settings. Similarly, asylum officials are likely to obtain testimonial accounts from asylum seekers who come from cultural backgrounds different from that of the asylum official. Also within international criminal justice settings, it is more likely that um, legal and investigative professionals that are investigating and adjudicating crimes committed in armed conflicts would obtain eyewitness accounts from witnesses who come from different cultural backgrounds. Various cultural norms may have implications for how people view, remember, and report about their experiences and how they behave in the course of cross-cultural interactions. Therefore, it is entirely possible that witnesses, victims, and other interviewees who are questioned within legal and investigative contexts will reflect certain culturally determined norms. Therefore, it is, it, it is increasingly challenging, you know, it will be a challenge if legal and investigative professionals have limited insight into their culturally uh, determined norms of such witnesses. Therefore, an understanding into the cultural norms or how the cultural background of witnesses may shape their testimonial accounts is extremely vital. However, research in eyewitness memory reports has mostly sampled from Western cultures with little consideration for witnesses socialized in non-Western cultures. Because psychological processes are not universal, 
it becomes necessary to sample across cultures. Therefore, in this program of research, I sought to examine whether there are cultural differences in eyewitness memory reports. The program of research basically was based on a proposition on individualism collectivism proposed by Hofstede. And in his proposition, which is based or was based on data from over 100 countries, Hofstede proposed that the cultures of the world falls on a continuum of individualism collectivism with cultures in Northern Europe. West, um, Western Europe, North America, leaning towards individualism and cultures in Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America leaning towards collectivism. Now, in his proposition of individualism collectivism, often they defines individualism to be the extent to which members see themselves as either loose or integrated within a social group. So for example, he proposes that for individualistic cultures or one of the, 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 the differences between individual socialized and individualistic cultures and collectivistic cultures is that whereas in individualistic cultures, there is emphasis on individuality, in collectivistic cultures, there is emphasis on communality. Also, the self construct is another way that individualistic and collectivistic cultures have been proposed to differ. Specifically, it's been proposed that whereas individuals socialized in individualistic cultures view the self as separate from the social context, that is what has been called the independent self construct Individuals socialized in collectivistic cultures view the self as separate from the social context, or sorry, not separate from the social context, in other words, they view the self as integrated in the social context, what has been referred to as the interdependent construct of the self. Emphasis on hierarchy in social relationships is another way that individualistic and collectivistic cultures have been proposed to differ, what has been referred to as power distance. Specifically, it's been proposed that whereas in individualistic cultures, there is less emphasis on hierarchy in social relationships. It's been proposed that in collectivistic cultures, there is, tends to be more emphasis in hierarchy in social relationships. Communication is another way that individualistic and collectivistic cultures have been proposed to differ. It's been proposed that whereas communication in individualistic cultures tends to be more explicit and more direct. Communication in collectivistic cultures tends to be less explicit and less direct. Further propositions do suggest that depending on whether individuals are socialized in individualistic or collectivistic cultures, it tends to shape their cognition. It's been suggested by Marcus and Kitayama that Whereas individuals socialized in individualistic cultures develop an analytic cognition, what has been uh, referred to as or defined as attending to focal details or reporting about focal details at a visual field, it's been proposed that individuals socialized in collectivistic cultures tend to attend to and report more contextual details at a visual field. Considering the proposed differences with regards to the possibility of an individual's culture of socialization impacting their behavior and psychological processes, it stands to reason that the eyewitness memory reports of individuals socialized in different cultures might not be the same. So in this program of research, I sought to find out whether the proposed cultural differences has any implication for eyewitness memory reports. In a series of experiments, I tested whether witnesses socialized in different cultures differ with regards to the content and the nature of their eyewitness memory reports. I sampled participants from cultures representing an, a collectivistic and individualistic cult, cultural orientations, specifically Ghana, 
and the Netherlands, respectively. In another study, participants representing an individualized cultural orientation were sampled from the United Kingdom. Participants first viewed a mock crime event and were later interviewed about what they had seen. I found that witnesses across the cultural group groups reported more central details than contextual details, showing that the proposed cultural differences on holistic and analytic cognition was not supported within this mock witness paradigm. I also found that witnesses with collectivistic cultural orientation reported fewer details about the crime scene than witnesses with an individualistic cultural orientation. I found also that witnesses with collectivistic cultural orientation refrained from reporting details they were unsure about than witnesses with an individualistic cultural orientation. Now, across the series of experiments that I conducted, one finding that stood out across the experiment with, with regards to the cultural differences in elaborate provision of details. And I argued that one factor that could account for this cultural difference is with regards to the role of the investigator as an authority figure in leading to differential outcomes. And this argument is based on the proposed cultural differences in emphasis on hierarchy in relating with authority figures. Specifically, whereas it's been proposed that whereas in individualistic cultures, there is less emphasis in hierarchy in relating with authority figures in collectivist cultures, there tend to be more emphasis in hierarchy. And these differences in relating with authority figures across cultures has been argued to lead to differences in spontaneous provision of details. Specifically, it's been argued that um, it tends to impede provision of details for individuals socialized in collective cultures when interacting with authority figures. Therefore, it stands to reason that within an investigative context, the role of an authority figure could lead to differential outcomes when witnesses from different cultures are being interviewed. So in one of the experiments, I sought to test this, where I actually specifically sought to find out whether the role of an investigator play a role in cultural differences in elaborate reporting. I sampled participants from cultures where there tends to be emphasis on hierarchy in social relationships, and also from a culture where there is less emphasis on hierarchy in social relationships. Specifically, participants were sampled from Ghana and the Netherlands, respectively. Mock witnesses first viewed a video event of a crime and later provided a free recall in writing of what they witnessed. Specifically, mock witnesses were asked to assume, to provide details, um, to assume whether they were reporting to either a police, that is a high authority, or a peer, that is a low authority. Following that, mock witnesses provided a confidence rating in their free recall report, after which they provided acute recall, again, based on what they viewed earlier. And again, mock witnesses were reminded whom those reports are being provided to, that is either to a police or to a peer. After that, mock witnesses provided confidence rating in their acute recall report after which they completed a measure of power distance. I found that witnesses from cultural backgrounds where there tends to be less emphasis on hierarchy in social relationships, on the measure of power distance, they tend to rate low on perceived power distance than witnesses from cultures where there tends to be uh, more emphasis on hierarchy in social relationships. Interestingly, I found that witnesses from cultures where there tend to be less emphasis in hierarchy in social relationships re reported more details about the crime scene when reporting to police detective than when reporting to a peer. However, 
I found that witnesses from cultures where they tend to be more emphasis in hierarchy in social relationships reported the same amount of details, whether they were reporting to a police or whether they were reporting to a peer. So that um, these findings so shows the possibility of the role of an investigator to lead to differential outcomes with regards to information provision when witnesses from different cultural backgrounds are being interviewed. So in conclusion, uh, legal and investigative professionals should be more culturally sensitive when obtaining eyewitness accounts in cross-cultural settings. It may be necessary to give consideration to our inter interviewees perceived power distance when eliciting memory reports in cross-cultural settings. That means that there is the need to uh, engage in an effective, for example, an effective rapport building that could mitigate some of these power imbalances. That also means that it will be necessary for future research to look at some cultural effective ways of building rapport in cross-cultural contexts. There's also a need for caution when using level of detail to assess witness credibility in cross-cultural settings. Thank you once again for your time and attention. I now give the word back to the Prorector. Thank you so much for your presentation. Now the opposition will be opened by Professor van der A. Professor van der A is Professor of Criminal Law and Criminal Procedure at our university and also the Chair of the Assessment Committee. Thank you. Uh, dear candidates, uh, I would first like to congratulate you on your uh, excellent dissertation and also excellent presentation. Thank you for that. You've done a lot of work conducting research in no less than three countries. And the result is a thesis that makes an important contribution both to theory and practice. It nuances the analytic holistic cognition theory, at least in forensic settings, and in addition, you make valuable suggestions on how to improve witness interviews in cross-cultural settings. I thought your thesis was thought-provoking, and it also raises some questions, like any good thesis should. Um, well, this brings me to my questions. Uh, you demonstrate on several occasions that witnesses from individualistic cultures and those from uh, sorry, collectivist cultures have different reporting styles. So those from individualistic cultures report more information, whereas the information provided by witnesses from collectivist cultures report less, but more accurate information. They make fewer mistakes. Well, what struck my attention was that most of your recommendations involve accommodating witnesses from collectivist cultures so that they would resemble the weird witnesses more. And I thought, isn't there something to be learned from collectivist culture reporting styles as well for the individu individualistic cultures? And shouldn't we perhaps also prime weird witnesses? I would like you to reflect on that. Thank you. Highly esteemed opponents, thank you for your kind words and for the interesting question. And uh, indeed, um, the cultural differences in elaborate reporting of details um, was observed. And um, with uh, regard to uh, the question on, for example, how witnesses from weird cultures could be primed to also report as witnesses from non weird cultures. Um, I think that, uh, for example, what's um, in one of the findings with regards to uh, witnesses from non weird cultures seem to engage in uh, seems to refrain from details they are unsure about in terms of the accuracy, like you mentioned, right? So I think that, for example, indeed, it may be uh, necessary and also interesting that future research might perhaps also explore uh, some with regards to the uh, memory processes that could lead to such difference between uh, individualistic and collective cultures, but more so that it might also be interesting to also explore uh, metacognition for non sorry, for, for weird cultures as well. Yeah, I think that's the 
uh, maybe to the extent to which I can speak to that, right? But that will also be an interesting area to explore. And thank you so, so much for the question. Are you satisfied with the answer? Very much so, thank you. Thank you. In that case, the opposition will be continued by Professor Fulbert. Professor Fulbert is Professor of Law and Psychology at the uh, Psychologische Hochschule in Berlin and also at the Institute of Forensic Psychiatry at the Charité Hospital. Um, she is a member of the assessment committee and she is joining us online in this ceremony. And I very much would like to welcome Professor Fulbert to Maastricht University. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, dear candidate, I also want to thank you for your important dissertation and for the nice presentation. And uh, my question is, um, I would like you to uh, reflect on the question whether the cultural effects you found are mainly uh, quest uh, effects of reporting behavior in the sense of behavioral effects or whether they are can whether they should also be attributed to cognitive processes in terms of differences in encoding and recalling so that would be my question highly esteemed opponents um thank you so much for uh, your kind words and also for the interesting question so with uh, regard to whether the cultural differences could also be um, attributed to cognitive, certain cogn cognitive processes, um, not maybe just at the reporting. And indeed, um, the literature do suggest that uh, cultural differences in with regards to eyewitness uh, memory uh, actually runs through from the encoding to, you know, recall and reporting. So. Uh, although not with, within eyewitness paradigm, I cannot speak too much uh, on eyewitness paradigm, but indeed um, literature, for example, autobiographical memory uh, actually do suggest uh, that uh, at the stage of encoding, for example, there tends to be cultural differences with regards to event segmentation when witnesses from different cultures um, are encoding, which also in a way lead to uh, is is being found that might also contribute to differences in the amount of details uh, that are recalled and uh, reported. So 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 that's the extent to which I can speak to that. But I think that it will be interesting for uh, within um, research in eyewitness memory to also look at at, at cultural differences um, with regards to encoding within a mock witness uh, paradigm. Uh, thank you once again for. The interesting question. Thank you. And Professor Volpeer, does, does that give rise to any reply on your part or are you satisfied with the yes. answer? Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Then the opposition will be continued by Professor Snook. Professor Snook is Professor of Psychology at Memorial University uh, in St. John, Newfoundland and also a member of the Assessment Committee. He is also joining us online in this ceremony. And I also would like to welcome him very much to Maastricht University today. Thank you very much. Um, I also wanted to, to start by applauding you for, for your efforts in your PhD work. Um, it was a, a very complex and quite an extensive undertaking to, to travel to all these countries and collect this data and have different supervisors with different perspectives. So um, I thought you, you did a fantastic job uh, with your research. Um, so my question, I'm going to take you a little bit away from your, your thesis, slightly away from your thesis, in the sense that I've recently been thinking a lot about the replication crisis that's currently occurring in psychology. And my colleagues and I are talking a lot about different solutions uh, to some of the problems that have been raised. And I also thought that your thesis work was very thought provoking. And one of the things that really stood out to me was this weird sample about how, how such you know, such a small proportion of the world represent such a large samples in psychology. And this sort of, in my mind, I started to think about how this is also part of the problem in psychology about representation and, and perhaps a replication crisis, and, but, but more also about understanding uh, human behavior and understanding 
you know, what's really happening out there. And so I, I just wondering if you could add your voice to this issue and based on everything you've read and all the research that you've, you've done over the last number of years, what, what kind of advice would you have to help sort of rectify this, this unfortunate imbalance that you've noticed and that you've pointed out? Uh, so for like, you know, if you could talk to a, say a group of journal editors, for example, um, what, what would you suggest? Where, where, where would you take them? Hi, Les opponents. Um, thank you very much for uh, your kind compliments and also uh, this interesting question. I indeed, uh, I think th this uh, has been a question that um, has come to the fore with regards to the representation of psychological research. And indeed, a recent um, a paper. Uh, I think not that recent, uh, one paper by uh, Henrik and a few others that uh, do suggest that um, research, uh, psychological research uh, published in top journals seem to 90% of the sample, over 90% of sample published in some top journals actually sample mostly from uh, Western or weird cultures. And whilst um, non-weird cultures, that seems to constitute um, the majority of global pop population, not much is known about. And I think that, uh, like you said, it's really important you know, to uh, bring it uh, up for uh, consideration. I know in a recent uh, European Association of Psychology and Law, I think that's one of the key or topical issues that um, was di discussed on cultural considerations in uh, psychological research and also uh, within investigative interview uh, context and eyewitness memory how to actually uh, uh, explore other non-weird uh, samples. And I think one of the uh, key issues maybe had to do with co collaboration, um, perhaps collaborating with researchers in uh, non-weird cultures who are also conducting um, research to actually also be able to make psychological research and eyewitness memory research more representative. So, so I, I think that's uh, one of the key issues in seeking to make psychological research more representative, the need for collaboration with uh, researchers uh, from my interaction with uh, other colleagues, uh, you know, back in Ghana and also from uh, other places there are researchers who are also eager, ready for collaboration. So I think that it's important that um, we uh, seek to, in as much as we discuss, to also find out uh, possible ways to reach out to uh, researchers, you know, who are ready to collaborate. I hope this answers your question. My listening opponent. So Professor Snook, are you? satisfied with the answer of the candidate? Uh, yeah. Or does I'm it give rise to I'm any happy. reply? Please, please. Thank you. Uh, no, Thank I'm you so much. Sa I'm very satisfied with the uh, the question, I, uh, the answer. I, I just think it's a, it's a tough, um, it's a tough question. And uh, I, th yeah, my feeling to add to us, I think we should have journal editors perhaps maybe take a little bit of a harder stance uh, like they're doing with how we go about reporting data. So I think the collaboration is important, but I also think that maybe there needs to be a, a push from the top down as well, maybe. But anyway, thank you for your answer. Thank you so much. Then the opposition will be continued by Dr. Harvey. Dr. Harvey is a senior lecturer in experimental psychology at the University of Portsmouth and also a member of the assessment committee. And it gives me great pleasure also to have him present here in the uh, assessment committee and the degree committee here present because of the fact, of course, that this is also a very special occasion today, having this uh, joint degree, double degree at the University of Portsmouth uh, uh, that for which you, on which you uh, wrote your thesis. So I very much welcome also uh, Dr. Harvey uh, to this ceremony and very happy to give you the floor. Thank you very much. And uh, hello again, and cancer. Um, I really enjoyed reading your thesis for a second time, having examined you um, over in Portsmouth. Um, 
I'm going to ask you a, a different question this time. We've asked you many questions before. Um, this is a, a sort of bigger picture question, really. Um, I was interested in these processes of culturally determined reporting norms. So if, if individuals adapt to the reporting norms of their adopted culture, how does this occur specifically for, in the context of witness interviewing and eyewitness memory? For most of us, uh, presumably, haven't had a great deal of experience in, in knowing what these norms are for reporting in these contexts. So uh, it would be good if you could kind of dig a little deeper and explain how, how these processes work. Um, as an opponent, um, thank you. Um, could you please, um, you, if I'm, um, I'm getting you, uh, you would want to know how the processes work with regards to the observed cultural differences. Can you please um, repeat the question again? Yeah, sure. So yeah. how do individuals internalize the cultural reporting norms, particularly in the context of eyewitness memory and, and you know, police interviews? Again, let me take it um, once more to be uh, sure I got the question right. So you would want to find out um, how uh, certain reporting norms are internalized. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, in with regards to, and can can I also clarify the part of investigative interviewing? I also had had a part of the question on investigative interviewing. Can you clarify that as well, please? Yeah. I think I mean, the point I'm making: yeah. cultural norms uh, are internalized through experience. But this is a rather unique experience of being, um, you know, an, an eyewitness being interviewed by police. And many of us have not had those experiences. So we wouldn't have been exposed to the reporting norms for that particular context. So I just wondered if you could uh, say a few words about how you think those processes might operate. Right. Um, let me attempt uh, to based on the, the, how I understand the question, but like, I mentioned, uh, so with regards to how certain norms are internalized by witnesses from different cultures, um, if again, if that's the question I'm getting, right? Okay, thank you. So, and thank you for your kind compliment as well. So with regards to um, uh, internalizing certain cultural norms, indeed the literature suggests that uh, socialization within different cultures might lead to uh, differential outcomes with regards to certain practices, with regards to customs, with regards to certain norms that are peculiar to certain cultural contexts, that they might lead to internalizing certain norms. And witnesses, when being interviewed within an investigative context, are likely to bring such culturally determined norms to the fore during investigative interviewing. I don't know whether that is sufficient for your, as in, I, the answer answers your question. Uh, well, yeah, I, I was just uh, interested in how they um, know the specific norms or how they might kind of uh, in, in incorporate those for, you know, interviewing context. Um, presumably they're soaking up uh, the culture, but this is a rather specific scenario. Um, okay, sorry, um, I'm a bit struggling to uh, hear the audio here, but um, with regard to specific scenarios where norm, certain norms are internalized, is that um, the question? Okay, so for example, um, literature suggests that, for example, cultural differences in elaborate reporting Right, one of the um, uh, propositions, and of course, uh, research uh, with um, children autobiographical memory actually um, have actual also suggests that even as early as childhood, there are cultural differences with regards to elaborate reporting, and that has been attributed to socialization and parenting practices by in in in, in different cultures. For example, whereas um, in many uh, Western cultures is being found that parents provide scaffold with um, in, in conversation with their children and therefore helps them in uh, building which later actually leads to 
uh, more, more elaborate reporting, it's been found that um, parenting in other non weird or collectivistic cultures actually seems to be more direct and instructional, and it's not more participatory or doesn't provide it much scaffold. That, so, so that is with regards to what the literature uh, seems to suggest with regards to socialization and how those norms. And uh, because of such differences, it's also uh, been found that it leads to uh, different models of reporting in, in different cultures so that uh, individuals actually uh, kind of tend to uh, have different differences model or differences in model with regards to their reporting. Then again, uh, also with regards to the models of reporting that it could also be to different expectations with regards to how complete a detail should be, right? That there could be different expectations for people from different cultures, maybe when they are asked to report about maybe something that the level of expectation for someone from a collectivistic culture might not be the same level of completeness for someone from an individualistic culture. So that with regards to socialization in different cultures, it may lead to differences in the model of reporting and also differences in expectations with regards to their level of completeness when they are asked to report. That's great. Thanks, Nkansa. You're saying it generalizes to all memory reporting scenarios. That's a great answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Then the opposition will be continued by Professor Schneider. Professor Schneider is Emeritus Professor of European Migration Law and a member of the Assessment Committee. Thank you. Dear candidate, my congratulations as well. I can join the other members of the committee. I really enjoyed reading your book. I enjoyed the really well structure and also the clear methodology explained and the different cases. So it was really a pleasure to read your thesis. What struck me, however, was a little bit the end, the conclusions and also in your proposition. You write in your fifth proposition, detailed and accurate information is the fulcrum of criminal investigation. I think we all would agree to that. Mm -hmm. But the lack of training on cultural issues for legal and investigative practitioners is detrimental to investigative interviewing. And you suggest that there should be more training. Right to all practitioners. Now, there, I think we could agree when we have read your thesis and perhaps from other experiences, also other theses. However, the question now for me is, when do we have to start with this? Do we have to start already here in a law school? Do we have, we talk a lot about the international classroom, we have uh, many international students. So do we have to start here already? Do we have to train all type of professionals, whether they are police investigations or whether they are in the judiciary, but also in the IND, I assume, um, constantly to this, but would it not even better, because I'm not sure whether training really will help on the long run, that we have much more mixed teams, if I take the Netherlands, that let's say we would find more professionals with a migrant background, to help this form of cultural awareness and also to see the differences. So, and then, I, I mean, I know the Dutch context rather well, but my further question would be, how would that be in Ghana? Would that be the same necessity training people from the very beginning interculturally, but also finding professionals in all type of professions from police to judiciary in the different with different cultural backgrounds. Mm, great. Um, highly esteemed opponent, thanks so much for uh, your kind compliment and also that interesting question. Um, with regards to uh, my fifth proposition, uh, that talks about training for uh, legal and investigative professionals on cultural sensitivity. Indeed, uh, I, I think it's um, something that uh, should begin as soon as possible, or it, maybe I'm sure the uh, some trainings that are already, you know, have started with regards to, in terms of incorporating certain cultural elements, you know, but of course it's uh, very much important that 
training of investigative practitioners and also legal, uh, legal practitioners uh, factor in some of these cultural elements to uh, really understand that indeed behavior and psychological processes are not universal and that witnesses uh, from certain cultural backgrounds are likely to bring culturally determined reporting norms into within their um, within the investigative context or the legal context. And there is the need to uh, be aware, at least uh, it begins with knowledge and preparation, at least with information about how witnesses differ with regards to their, for example, in their eyewitness accounts. It's kind of, uh, I think it's a way of beginning the sensitization or, you know, for legal investig investigative practitioners. And also, I'm happy you also mentioned with regards to uh, not just maybe current practitioners, for example, people who are in law faculties who are also staying at least to kind of create that awareness so that these are uh, those who, are, who end up mostly um, within uh, as, as legal and investigative practitioners. Uh, so that uh, that awareness uh, that early, I think, would help. And more so, it's uh, important that. Um, uh, training focus on evidence-based knowledge with regards to maybe cultural differences or how effective to interview witnesses from uh, different cultural backgrounds. So indeed, I, I agree that it's important that uh, practitioners be trained, right? But it's also important that within uh, law faculty, students um, who are being trained to become legal investigative practitioners actually or any other faculty actually be sensitized or uh, within the curriculum it's uh, be built on certain cultural courses that will sensitize uh, trainees to such cultural differences yeah so, so thank you very much for the question Thank you so much. In that case, the opposition will be continued by Professor De Ruiter. Professor De Ruiter is Professor of Forensic Psychology at our university and also a member of the assessment committee. Dear candidate, your dissertation was indeed an interesting read as uh, a lot of my predecessors have already remarked. I admire the effort you took in collecting your samples both in different areas in your native Ghana and among the Ghanaian immigrants and other immigrants in the Netherlands. I know it takes time to collect field data, but it's highly, highly relevant to the generalizability of your findings. There's already too many eyewitness memory studies on psychology students. <laughs> So, but now I'm here to ask you a, a question and I would like you to go to uh, page 73 of your thesis. And there's a little paragraph um, above uh, the discussion. It says migrants and self-reported individualism slash collectivism. And I am puzzled by those findings. And I'm also puzzled by the fact that you didn't use the data on the cultural orientation scale. I will explain why. Um, you note here the interesting and somewhat intriguing finding that self-reported collectivism between migrants from Africa in Europe and Africans still located in Africa did not differ. They were not different on collectivism. They were only different on individualism. Um, and I'm just puzzled by this. What does this mean? I always understood half status work as, uh, yeah, but maybe you have to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I thought collectivism and individualism were like two ends of one dimension. Co on the one hand, collectivism, and on the other hand, individualism. Well, it's clearly not the case because you, you find these version findings, or maybe you have another explanation for this. And then my second question is, why did you not use the cultural orientation skill in your study as, you know, an extra, yeah, source of information? 
uh, because you, you're now only doing like a post hoc check on whether these samples differed. Uh, wouldn't it have been, yeah, uh, nice or uh, an idea to use the score on those two dimensions as predictors in a regression model? So to use them, um, yeah, to predict uh, the level of detail or the level of incorrect detail, et cetera. So these are my questions. Hi, listen, opponents. Um, thank you for your kind words and also for uh, the interesting question. Indeed, uh, this is uh, something, you know, that uh, had, come, uh, uh, had come up with regards to, let me begin from uh, individualism, collectivism, whether they are on a continuum or whether they are, you know, different. And indeed, it's an interesting question because um, some argue that, uh, some argue that cultures fall on a dimension of individualism, collectivism, but the argument is that within every culture, there is a bit of individualism, a bit of collectivism, but there is one that predominates over the other. So that in some cultures where there might be a bit of individualism and collectivism, you might have collectivism uh, predominating. That's a typical collectivistic culture. Whereas maybe in a typical individualistic culture, you might have also a bit of collectivism and individualism, but the individualism might predominate. So uh, other researchers actually would want to explore both dimensions and not just look at it on a continuum, right? So that's the reason why those dimensions were used. Now, to the question on why, for example, the two groups were similar on the measure of collectivism. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, indeed, um, later on in the discussion, I actually discussed because, um, because the measures or the data actually uh, it contradicted what is well known and what other studies on individualism and collectivism suggest. And one of the things that I discussed as a limitation to the work is with regards to uh, perhaps a check on the use of self-reported um, measures when conducting a cross-cultural study because cultures might differ in their response patterns, right? So that individuals socialize in certain cultures in their responding to rating skills. Their response might not be the same as individuals socialize in a different culture. So that uh, in taking just the raw data and looking at that might be misleading. So in the discussion, indeed, I share experience that are on the hindsight that I share experience from using this uh, skill in this research that it's important that future research conducting cross-cultural service actually build in a check. For example, um, research shows that cultures differ in extreme response patterns and acquaintance response patterns, as well as social desirability responding. So that in conducting cross-cultural service, it's important to uh, build in, for example, using a measure of social desirability that could be controlled for in subsequent analysis. So I share some of these experiences that to actually uh, improve cross-cultural research, it's important to make these considerations or factor in this into designing such research. So that's one of the things that I share as a limitation to using this uh, scale to actually compare cultures. That it might not be representative of what is actually the case with regards to cultural orientations because of differences in response patterns. So that is that, but however, it's also important to note that um, within cultures, it can give some, um, uh, some insights. For example, with regards to collectivism, what I did was that in as much as the two cultural groups did not differ, I actually conducted a correlational analysis um, with, with regards to the duration of residence of migrants and their self-reported collectivism. And I found that um, longer duration of residence leads to less co collectivism. 
so that within that that could at least give us some some idea with within cultural comparison since the their response pattern are likely to be the same so that is one then with regards to elaborate reporting i also found that the a uh, longer duration of residence actually actually led to more elaborate reporting. So um, we can get some insight with, within cultural comparison when we, sorry, we can get some insight with regards to cultural orientations when we are looking at within cultural comparisons. But I think caution should be made when looking at cross-cultural, um, you know, comparison since different cultures might have uh, certain response patterns, you know, so, 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 so that is what I will see. So thanks so much for uh, that thought provoking <laughs> uh, question. And uh, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah, it, it doesn't answer my question, but I, I have one follow up question okay. or, or remark. Um, I mean, if I. And it actually means that um, cross-cultural differences, as we are talking about it now, uh, are highly like uh, connected to the individual. You know, I, I, I'm reminded of uh, a conversation I once had with a colleague who's from Korea, and uh, originally, of course, a very different culture from Western Europe. She's lived in Germany now for many years. And she says that when she returns to Korea, she has the feeling that she's talking much more with her hands and she feels like a completely out of place there. Uh, so so I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of a psychiatrist, uh, Frank Kortman in the Netherlands, who's a really, uh, yeah, at the forefront, very activistic about, you know, transcultural psychiatry, etc. And he always said, you know, ultimately, culture is about the individual. You know, there's a difference between a person who's raised in an urban environment in the Netherlands mm -hmm. versus a person who's raised in a very rural farming community. So what does this mean for people who are, yeah, police investigators? I mean, we cannot assume that because, you know, my skin is white, I'm a certain person. Right, yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Indeed, that's also an important question here yeah, because indeed, in as, in as much as we, we look at um, cultural differences, right? It's also important to also look at within cultural comparisons and also even not just within cultural comparisons, but also individual differences, right? So that, for example, within cultural comparison, there are subcultures, right? Now, there are subcultures that these subcultures might also differ in some way. So I think it's important, and I highlight that in my research, that it's important that future research also look at within cultural comparisons to give more insights, right? So that people from the same culture might also have certain differences with regards to how they report. And also not just with the, the subculture too, but also, for example, um, with regards to collectivism, let's take as an example, that individuals from the same cultural group might also differ in the extent or the level of the, the collectivism. So that it's important that we, in as much as it's important to uh, look at uh, cross-cultural or you know, at the larger level, we also look at within culture or the subcultures and also begin to look at individual differences. Okay, thank you. The opposition will now be continued by Dr. Van Veldhuizen, who is Assistant Professor of Psychology and Law at the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. And I very much welcome her back in a way to Maastricht. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, dear candidate, I uh, gladly endorse the earlier given compliments. Uh, having studied interviewing practice and credibility assessments in asylum procedures, uh, I often have my found myself frustrated by the general lack of knowledge uh, about the effects of culture on memory formation and reporting, especially applied to legal contexts. So I think your research offers valuable insights, and I hope and know that it instigates more research uh, in to this increasingly important topic. Um, but of course, I also have a question. Uh, my question relates to the cross-cultural reporting model that you propose in chapter six. 
you sketch how an independent and interdependent self-construal interact with uh, authority in the interview to produce self-enhancing or self-effacing behaviors, uh, ultimately leading to predictions about the elaboration of uh, reporting. I question the generalizability of the proposed model. And uh, that's because uh, in the training and workshops I give to asylum officials, I often say to them, you have to ask open questions. You have to get a free narrative because then we get long and elaborate answers. And I sometimes encounter resistance from the professionals. And then they say something along the following lines. If I ask an open question to an Eritrean, I only get a yes or no, or maybe a very brief answer. Uh, they will never elaborate. On the other hand, if I ask an open question to an Iranian asylum seeker, I will get a narrative of several pages full of irrelevant details and I won't be able to finish in time. So the first part of that observation seems to align with your model. Uh, Eritrea is probably a, a highly collectivistic and high power distance country. So the, the uh, under reporting that they, that they uh, describe is, is in line with the model you propose. However, the response style of those Iranian asylum seekers seem to be at odds with your model. Because Iranians, although uh, maybe higher on individualism and lower on power distance than Ghana, are still relatively collectivistic and relatively high uh, in power distance. So based on your model, I would predict mild self-effacement strategies, um, maybe not so much as in Ghana or Eritrea, uh, especially in interaction with authority. However, the story uh, by the asylum officials paints a very different picture to me, uh, namely of extreme elaboration and self-enhancement behaviors. So can you speculate on the possible explanations for the observations of those asylum officials? Um, is there another factor included in your model that can account for those differences? Or do you think the asylum officials are wrong in their observations? Highly esteemed, esteemed opponent, thank you so much for uh, your interesting question and also for your kind compliment. Um, indeed, I propose you know this model that depending on who, um, whether from with uh, with a, an orientation that is an independent self construal or interdependent self construal, it might lead to uh, different levels of self presentation, right? And that level of self-representation might also differ depending on who, uh, in this case, asylum seekers are reporting to, right? Now, which also would in turn lead to different levels of elaboration. What I also propose is that, um, whereas, for example, this proposition is based on uh, findings from this research, that it would also be important that it's also interesting, um, <laughs> thanks for sharing too, you know, know that because that, that means that, for example, that maybe if nothing at all, maybe other collectivity cultures, right, in seeking to test this model, right, to seek it, to, 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 to test it across uh, collectivity cultures. So it might be important to, for example, say that it not maybe just testing it within um, Western European or South Southern African co context, but maybe other individual and collectivity cultures. For example, maybe a Middle Eastern, um, or maybe Asian cultures or Latin American cultures, right? So I think that's what I, the extent to which I can speak to, that with that then, uh, the, the, the application or the applicability of the model can be constrained to know that, okay, in this context or with regards to, to asylum seekers from certain cultural backgrounds, um, this model will not apply to them, but may apply to uh, asylum seekers from maybe a particular culture background, depending on how, um, when it's tested, how valid the model would, would be. So I, I don't know that if that answers your question, but I think that it's important that um, the model is tested uh, across cultures. Can I follow up shortly? Um, I agree that it's very important to test the model uh, across cultures, but could it also be that the the observation, they also say that it's a lot of irrelevant details they get. So um, could it be that the Iranians maybe report a lot, mm. they're very elaborate, mm. but they don't focus on the central details or on the details that the asylum official wants to hear, and that that may be the difference with individualistic cultures? I think that's that, that, possibility, that possibility, 
right? Um, with regards to, for example, that's fine. It may be to, it could be that in this case, um, the asylum seekers in question, right, might provide quite a number uh, of responses, right? So then, by regards to the detail, might uh, the the detail uh, there might not be enough or sufficient detail, even though they give a lot of, you know, they respond responding. So in this context, I I think that because uh, this model uh, applies to detailed provision, right? So that in this context, then it could apply. You may briefly conclude your reply if you see a reason for that. Thank you. So in this context, that with regards to detailed provision, then the model with, will apply Right, because um, from your experience that even though they give a lot of responses in terms of detail, they are not many. So yes, and the then the model was based on the number of details that are provided, right? So that if a, it is in terms of the number of details, then the model might apply to them, but it's still important to, like I mentioned, test the model to uh, with regards to the, the applicability across cultures. Thank you. Mr. Anakwa, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. <laughs>
Kamsa Amakwa, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. In view of its positive verdicts and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Your supervisors are authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. And they, they will do so partly online and partly here present in the aula. And I'll first invite your supervisor, Professor Van Koppen, to take the floor. Dear Mr. Kenneth, Dear Mr. Kenneth. do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times to be careful and honest transparent independent and responsible yes i do thank you by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online and on site in maastricht i hereby confer upon you the Kansa Anakwa, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and by law. As evidence, you will receive the degree candidate out of the hands of Dr. Horslenberg. It is signed by the rector, the secretary, and the supervisor, and affixed by the official seal of the university. I will now proceed with the laudatio. Dear Dr. Anakwa, dear and counsel, what a travel you have been on to achieve this, the final destination here in Maastricht. I still remember your application in our first meeting with Skype to get your job. Although there were internet issues, you were still able to explain your plans and theoretical background of your research so well that Peter, Lorraine and I had no doubt. We want this keen and motivated applicant from Ghana. From that decision on, you have astonished us with your ideas and the results of these ideas. And from then on, you also had to move over to this weird country and acculturate. You were so keen to learn that you wanted to try out all kinds of food and drinks, non-alcoholic. And during our first lunch together with your colleagues from the house and the tribunal, you insisted on trying carnamelic. You remember? I do remember carnamelic buttermilk for the English speakers, kind of buttermilk. We warned you that even amongst Dutchies, this was not a favorite drink Nevertheless, you tried. You tried to hide your disgust, even took a second sip before you decided that you understand why the Dutchies don't like carnamelic. But it was your curiosity that showed us that your, our decision to take you as a PhD candidate was a very good one, because curiosity is the core of good practice in science. So your keenness to get your PhD in legal psychology took you to Maastricht and you had to leave your beautiful home country, Ghana. In all the years you were here, you've never complained that it was hard for you to live here. Only when temperatures started dropping during the winter, it was a bit cold, you said, and it was only September. 
But life here also came with the nice surprise for you. You had your first experience with snow. I still remember you on Monday morning entering my office being very happy that you felt snowflakes and you saw snow falling on the ground. Most of all, you've given me, and I think also I speak for, speak for Peter, the most impressive experience ever. In November 2009, we went to visit Ghana together with you. Many of your participants came from Ghana and much of your work was besides setting up studies, arranging help or gather your data yourself. For Peter and me, this was the opportunity to see what energy and quality it took for you to collect your data. And of course, it was also a nice occasion for us and to visit Ghana. But most importantly, it was also a little present of us for you to reunite with your family. Besides visits to Ghana, or to Accra and Cape Coast, we also went inwards, the rural villages where you showed us in which church the student assistants and you were kindly allowed to test the participants. You showed us how you collected your participants. There was the central market square with speakers on high poles shouting out the message over the fields, please help Anakwa, because we found out that's your first name in Ghana. Um, please help out and come to the church at two o'clock. And then there were lines of people who wanted to be tested. Um, we were constantly amazed by your perseverance, your dedication and your organizing qualities. You not only arranged visits to rectors and deans in several cities and universities, but also that we could present the field of legal psychology to law and psychology students. You were even able to visit, uh, to arrange a visit to a judge. Definitely, he needed some more awareness of legal psychology. We were also treated so well by your family. We visited your mother, your grandmother, your brothers, your aunts, and we were served with the traditional Ghanaian food, but also she gave us a very beautiful present. And at least I promised your mother, I'm going to wear the shirt or change clothes after we had our drinks. But it's the kindness and poli politeness that runs in the family, which really was so nice. For me, supervising you was a f as being your travel companion. It is also the final destination of a long journey Peter and I started. It all began with Tanya, and now you're in number eight, our last PhD together. Clearly, you made this final tra travel a very comfortable one, for which I would like to thank you. And I also would like to thank the opportunity, or take the opportunity to thank Peter for being such a good supervising partner in the past 10 years. Now it's time to say some final words. And of course, everybody wants a drink. First of all, I want to congratulate you again. Also your family, your brother who's present here, and all your friends, they can all be very proud of you. And I hope you're also proud of yourself. At least Peter and I and Lorraine, we are. And I wish you all the best in the future. You know, it's my biggest wish and hope that you are going to be the first professor of legal psychology in Ghana. You possess all the qualities you got. And Gansa, het ga je goed. On behalf of the university and the faculty of law, many congratulations on the degree you just acquired. As you know, it's the highest degree we have available at this university. And I also uh, would like to include um, your family and friends, party present here, um, in these congratulations. Um, I also congratulate your supervisors, uh, Professor Van Koppen, uh, Professor Hope, uh, and Dr. Horselenberg. Uh, and like I said, this is a special PhD also for our university because uh, we work together in this with the University of Portsmouth. And I would like to point out how much we appreciate that. Um, I also thank everyone who has been watching this uh, ceremony uh, online. Uh, we're always able to see how many people participate in the online ceremony. And there were quite a few also in this one, which again also shows the many friends that you have around the, uh, around the world. Um, 
Now, um, I have a few practical remarks still to make, in particular for everyone who is present here in the uh, in the aula. Um, there's a reception that is going to take place in the in the garden. If you do not know where that is, just follow the Maastricht people. They will guide you towards the uh, the garden where indeed the drinks can be uh, can be had. And I would like to invite everyone to, after the I have officially closed the ceremony, to already uh, uh, go there and indeed have a uh, drink. While we are going to take still a photo here in this room um, with your supervisors, with all the members of the committee and everyone who is present here in the, uh, I should not say that word, in the corona. Uh, so that means we're going to stay uh, here for a few more minutes to make that photo and everyone is invited already to go to the uh, reception. Um, and with this, I also officially close this academic ceremony. Recording stopped.